So today's speaker is um, Professor, um, no, Director Paola Caselli now. Um, so Paola is a, one of the directors of the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Munich. And she's also visiting professor at Leeds and the University of Florida at Gainesville, Ludwig Maximilian's University in Munich. <laughs> sure thing. And um, she studied physics and astronomy at the University of Bologna. And uh, in her PhD, she worked at Ohio State University with Eric Herbst, and also here with Phil Myers. And she's been a researcher at the Osservatorio Astrophysica de Arquetri. <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, with Galileo, along with Galileo. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she was. Um, Visiting uh, scientists at UC Berkeley, yeah, right, and lecturer in uh, the Department of Astronomy here at Harvard University, where she did her best work with me. <laughs> um, that's about wraps it up. So that's a bit biased, and, uh, but yeah. She's going to uh, <laughs> talk about astrochemistry at the dawn of star and planet formation. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, Eddie. Uh, <clears throat> so. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm actually just so excited to see all of you guys. I mean, it feels really like coming back home and, uh, you know, giving this talk to my family. So I'm, I'm even more kind of nervous as uh, I should be. So I apologize if for some time I just say something and just ask questions if something doesn't make sense. So anyway, so I will, uh, yeah, today I will just go through uh, some of the uh, important steps uh, toward the formation, uh, say, of uh, stars and planets, uh, following these uh, through the astrochemistry tale. And uh, uh, we will see that uh, actually uh, it is very important, uh, one stage in this uh, star, for star and planet formation process, <laughs> that uh, is uh, uh, this uh, starless course. As we will see, there are many of the processes that we then uh, give, uh, uh, say, um, results uh, and, uh, for example, produce molecules that we will also see them later on in these other phases. So, so these are the various steps. So we start, uh, of course, we start with clouds, interstellar medium uh, material that then uh, contracts uh, and forms some dense regions, uh, and uh, these dense region fragments form dense cores, uh, and you have uh, then uh, the formation in some of these dense cores, the formation of protostars that then uh, evacuate uh, the uh, the cloud, and then you see these beautiful disks. And uh, here, of course, you can follow these various stages, and even nowadays in our solar system, where we see and we can measure uh, primitive material that is uh, within uh, rocks, uh, like uh, carbonaceous chondrites. So the question is, uh, is there actually any link between uh, this uh, phase and the, the later uh, stages? So I will try to show you that actually, yes, we think there are some links. And so let's move on, and uh, I want to give you a little bit more motivation. So we know now about 200 molecules, and without considering isotopologues. So these are uh, the, the majority of the molecules that are known and seen in space are organic in nature. So the greenish molecules here are organic in nature. And uh, some of them are actually important uh, building blocks that then uh, are uh, uh, can form even more uh, complex organics, like prebiotic molecules, like, for example, the amino acetonitrile that was discovered in 2008 by our Nobel Lotion collaborators. This is just a step away from glycine, the simplest uh, amino acid. And of course, if we look at the primitive material in our solar system, we see in uh, some of these uh, uh, meteorites, so in particular some of the most primitive carbonaceous chondrites, a lot of, uh, uh, basically, the building blocks of life. So we have not even uh, just the 20 amino acids that we use in life, but we have hundreds of them. You can choose uh, any, anything you want, and then uh, you have not just that, you have the fatty acids, you have nucleobases, basically everything you need to build a, a living being. Then, of course, the question is how you do that. That is a big question that uh, is, uh, many people are still working on. Good, okay, so the outline, so I will just go through um, 
some, say, historical uh, views uh, to do an introduction about molecular clouds and then scores. Then I will uh, move into these uh, important uh, processes that are like the freeze out and the deuterium fraction. That, by the way, it's important also because uh, also in our Earth, as you know, our ocean are deuterated in a sense. The water, there is a ratio between heavy water and water that is 10 times larger than the uh, D over H cosmic abundance. Talk about uh, uh, the water and the pristellar core dynamics, uh, and then uh, some uh, complex, organic uh, complex organic molecules uh, in uh, various uh, uh, phases. Uh, and then if I have the time, I'll show you some of the recent work that we have been doing on the early phases of the uh, protoplanetary disk. So let's get moving. Uh, our galaxy, so I think I don't need to explain much here, except for the fact that where you see these uh, dark lanes that are those where cold material, in particular gas and dust, uh, with temperatures, say, below 100 Kelvin, uh, they basically don't shine at all if you look at them in the optical. But, as we know, since many years now, they shy in molecules. And you see these molecules, these organic molecules, basically everywhere. Of course, the oil is the most abundant of them. And uh, then, <clears throat> in fact, the CO is not... Uh, say, the best uh, tracer of uh, the dense regions where uh, the stars are forming. Like, uh, you need to go to rarer isotopologues, and now you start to see some correlation between the young stellar objects that are in colors and uh, the dark uh, regions here that are the uh, filaments seen in 13 CO. If you want to just focus on the filaments, then you have to go even uh, deeper in, and then you need to use uh, even uh, rarer isotopologues, like c 18 o and now you start to kind of identify sometimes uh, the so-called dense cores. This is uh, uh, work uh, uh, led by Phil Myers uh, and collaborated this uh, uh, very important paper in 1989 where it showed um, very important properties of these regions where actually stars, so these are the basic units of star formation. But you don't see them very well in CO. You see them in molecules like ammonia, you see them in molecules that actually requires a bit higher density than what is required for the CO line to be excited. And in, for example, this is work that I did when uh, I was here and then uh, published a bit later. Uh, it was on the N2H plus that uh, this is a great tracer of dense gas. And by dense, I mean anything that is uh, between a few times 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6 uh, per cubic centimeter, <coughs> H2 molecules per cubic centimeter. So, uh, with Eric, uh, we then uh, look into these a little bit uh, deeper and uh, realize that actually there, there seems to be some kind of two classes of these dense cores. So, we are talking about now dense cores that have not yet a star yet. We, we are interested, I'm interested in understanding how stars form, so I want to know the initial conditions. So, on the sky in our galaxy, these nearby cores that you can measure very much in detail, you can look at their density profiles. You can look at the abundance of CO, which is here. So this is in uh, log CO, is the red. This is the transmission, so it's e to the minus uh, visual extinction, and the log density, so this is uh, in uh, the blue. So you start to see striking differences between uh, uh, different cores, in this particular case it's B68 and L1544. What is the main difference here? The main difference is that uh, cores like 1544 are highly centrally concentrated, that they have very spiky type of uh, density profile, and you also have a, a very sharp <clears throat> CO frees out. So CO disappears, and I will show you in a minute. Uh, so these things, what happened here is that uh, we have also line profile molecules that, of course, are unique tracers of dynamics that can tell us that in uh, this case uh, here, for example, this is work uh, that was uh, led by Charlie Lada uh, here, showing that uh, these line profiles are consistent with oscillation. In, uh, uh, in this case uh, here, we have actually profile consistent with the contraction motions. <clears throat> and uh, we call this, uh, or say I call this, so from now on, I call these pre-stellar cores. Why? Because uh, these are the cores that are going to form stars, because they are, uh, say, out of equilibrium. They are contracting. We see that there is inward motion, so it's very hard to, uh, say, believe that they will not form a, a star. 
So let me just uh, uh, give you now a switch into the uh, chemistry a little bit more. So this is the millimeter dust continuum emission. Uh, from uh, this uh, pristellar core that we have been studying very much because uh, it's very nearby, it's bright. And uh, as you can imagine, this pristellar core don't have a very long life because uh, they are short-lived. These are going to form stars <laughs> relatively soon. So then uh, what uh, it means is that uh, you are not going to find them many around, okay? So it means that if you find one, look at that and, you know, just try to understand what's going on as much as you can and then try to find some others. Anyway, so this is the dust peak that you see. So in, uh, uh, again, long time ago, we did uh, this measurement of the C17 yaw showing that uh, there is uh, a nice hole in this yaw in correspondence of the dust peak. And remember that this is uh, an optically thin isotopolog and you can even measure the optical depth because it has hyperfine components. So the best way, or say the simplest way to understand this is that uh, you have CO molecules freezing out onto the surface of dust grains. How much of this? Well, actually, if you use uh, CO as a tracer of mass, well, you are actually in error here because uh, you, lo you lose about 2.3 solar masses uh, out of the total solar mass of the whole uh, core here, which is about eight solar masses. So this, for the central region, definitely CO is not good. Of course, I should uh, quote uh, here uh, earlier work done by Willacy and uh, uh, also worked by Ted Bergen uh, in, on B68. <clears throat> so in these cases, these are less centrally concentrated objects, so that it's uh, not as extreme as this. Now, the, once you have a CO freeze out, you then need to find the molecule that is good in tracing the central region. So that was our job more than 10 years ago. And uh, we actually found that uh, the deuterated molecules are very good tracers of regions uh, that uh, where CO is frozen out. We kind of knew that because there was a theory that I will show you that told us actually in the 80s that that was the case. So this is again the uh, submillimeter continuum emission. This is the N2H plus in color. This is the N2D plus in color. You start to see the shift in the peaks. Uh, N2H plus is not actually peaking toward the dust peak. There is already, you start to see some freeze out of the N2H plus here, but N2D plus is peaking. And the, the, uh, fra uh, the fraction of this deuteration is 20%. And you have to compare with this with the 1.5 times 10 to the minus five, which is the D over H cosmic abundance. There have been uh, many, uh, you know, here I'm not even quoting all, but uh, many papers uh, measuring the ethereum fractions, and you can see that uh, some numbers go really high, uh, close to unity. I just put these in uh, yellow, not just because Silvia Spezzano is in my group now, and she's doing a great job, but also because there are some people from the audience here, like Mike McCartney, who actually uh, helped us with these uh, studies. So, so this was the discovery of the doubly deuterated uh, uh, C3D2 and the measurement of the deuteration. It's not just this little core that has this high deuteration and see off result. We see this everywhere we look at. Of course, you have to choose a region that is relatively quiescent. You don't want to go nearby a massive star because then, of course, you have feedback, you have heating, and you're not going to find the initial conditions. You have triggered the conditions, but that is not what we are interested. Uh, so here, for example, an infrared dark cloud, these are these very dense clouds that are seen uh, say in, uh, uh, so they are opaque in, in the infrared, that's why they're called the infrared dark clouds. And uh, what you see here is the map of the N2D plus. So we have the N2D plus, uh, actually uh, the all uh, around this map is quite extended. And also the CO is uh, uh, depleted. Here we get up to depletion factors of five, which means that uh, uh, say about 85% of the CO is in the, on the surface of the grains. The uh, thing here that I wanted to show is just that, you know, there are many now studies that have been done. So it seems that it's a quite uh, universal, at least to say in our uh, galaxy, universal factor that you have this, this, this uh, freeze out of molecules and then uh, this activation of the deuteration. How does it go? Uh, well, this is, I think, the main reaction. You see, this goes uh, back to the 70s by Watson, who studied this process. And uh, uh, 
pointed out that this reaction is exothermic, so in cold gas, this reaction cannot proceed from uh, uh, right to left. And uh, then there was Dalgarno and uh, Lepp, who in 84, with a very short paper, they uh, explain uh, very well that actually if neutrals, for any reason, they didn't even mention, say, freeze out, if for any reason uh, this... Uh, um, say, neutrals like CO and N2 and oxygen that destroy these ions are gone, you have an increase in this uh, ratio. And the reason is that you have lower destruction rates on one side for the, both of these ions and also higher formation rate just because these proceed faster because you have more H3+. plus. So, so at the end, you have the larger D over H and uh, these, of course, uh, can move on, uh, not just to H2D+, plus, but also D2H+, plus, et cetera. And in fact, uh, this is what we saw, I mean, a very bright H2D+, plus ortho line. Uh, this was back in 2003. And this was in one of these pre-stellar cores. So it was very uh, well matched with the theory, although at that time, uh, the theory, uh, say the chemical theory, was not very good because we couldn't predict uh, uh, these uh, when we did uh, these uh, observations, I mean, in our proposal. But anyway, this was great because uh, we could actually trigger uh, great people to do new laboratory work, to do theory on this uh, uh, ion, and uh, this is the work that uh, we are still uh, uh, doing at the moment. There is a little trick about the deuterium fraction, but actually the trick is uh, kind of uh, good for us because we can learn how to use this uh, uh, for measuring ages of clouds. That has been uh, a kind of uh, difficult problem, and it probably still is because there are, of course, uh, observational difficulties, etc. but I think we are getting close to this. So what it is, I'll try to explain briefly here. So we have uh, the uh, H2 molecule that uh, has uh, two forms, has the para and the ortho. This is the, depends on the orientation of the spins. And uh, the para has a ground state at zero level, and then uh, the ortho has uh, the ground state at much higher energy. Now, depending on uh, what is the collisional partner for this reaction uh, here, so for the, to go back, say, to the H3 uh, plus and HD, if you have ortho H2 that is more energetic, it will overcome more easily this activation energy uh, and uh, it will uh, basically drive the reaction backward and reduce the deuterium <laughs> fraction. So it's very important to understand what is the ortho to par H2. It's not just that you want to know the temperature, the density, to, to understand the, the chemistry. You also need this ratio, and this ratio is terribly hard to measure because uh, you see here these energies, so there is no way that we're going to see these lines in, uh, in cold gas. The other curve here is the deuterium fraction. So you see that uh, as you move down in this curve, there is a mirror curve that is the deuterium fraction that goes up and uh, reaches the values that are typically observed. So you really, so it, we have to have this uh, plateau here. We have to arrive at this plateau here to, uh, say, reproduce what is seen in some of these uh, uh, objects. So uh, we talk about, you see, million years, and uh, that uh, is... Uh, um, for this dense gas, sometimes this means that uh, you are looking at uh, objects that are probably standing there since about a million years, which is about sometimes 10 times the uh, freefall time or dynamical time, because we are talking about the densities of the order 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, uh, and even more. Uh, so anyway, uh, I hear very quickly just to say uh, two things. Uh, so one is that the chemistry of these ions is actually very simple uh, and it has been tested and uh, we, at the end you can reduce the system to very few expressions. And the other thing that I want to say here is that, okay, you cannot measure ortho to par H2, but you can measure the ortho to par H2 D plus and these two things are, uh, say, uh, very, say, can be connected with the coefficients that are just the rate coefficients of this reaction with plus and minus just meaning uh, forward, uh, forward and backward. Uh, and then uh, you can actually, if you measure these, you can understand these and you can have a uh, understanding of this time scale. One thing that I didn't say here is that why do we start with three here? Well, the starting of three here is the starting point when molecules are formed on dust grains, and we think that the H2 uh, 
we'll just uh, take off the uh, statistical ratio, which is three to one. Okay. Okay, so then uh, we did that. We have uh, the ortho H2D plus that can be observed uh, with Apex, for example. Uh, back 10 years ago was the CSO that uh, we used. And now, uh, unfortunately, Herschel was not able to detect the line, the 1.37 terahertz line of uh, para H2D plus, but with Sophia, we were able to do it along the line of sight of a very young protostar. So a region where you have still a lot of cold M Envelope, so you are probing the cold material along the line of sight. And in this case, we got, so comparing these two, and of course with our chemical uh, models and staying as conservative as possible, we found, uh, say, age estimates of about uh, 10 times the uh, free fall time. So a region that uh, must, uh, in a sense, have some support of extra support. Uh, otherwise, it was supposed to collapse, say, toward the center and for the star. These are the lines I have been talking about, just in case you're interested uh, in trying to detect them. So I just say that the par H2D plus and the ortho D2H plus can only be observed with uh, Sophia. So the, ortho, the para D2H plus, I should say also quote the work done by Berenger Paris in 2011, where she detected it uh, in uh, a core in Ophiuchus. And now we have also, for, this is the first detection of ortho D2H plus with Sophia that was done uh, not long ago. And the Yorma Harhu is re leading this uh, work. You see this beautiful absorption line again. And uh, you also have uh, interesting shape of the line. So you can actually learn about the kinematics of this envelope. And uh, so there is all the modeling going on, but I don't want to bother you with this now. So deuterated molecules are great uh, species to uh, say, measure the motions and the properties of the central region of this uh, force. <coughs> Here, for example, uh, I have uh, the work done by Antonio Crapsi in 2007, where we have uh, some interferometric data. The color is interferometric uh, ammonia, and here is interferometric deuterated ammonia. This dashed circle here is the same as this one, this is just a zoom in, and this is the 90% contour of the dust continuum emission at uh, 1.3 millimeter. So you see that the deuterated molecule just peak there, and you can also learn, of course, with the kinematics, so you can learn about uh, velocity gradients, so you can learn about uh, specific angular momentum, and this is one thing that uh, we found that uh, going from scales of uh, a fraction of a parsec, say 0.1 parsec of the core, uh, that is traced by the ammonia down to, say, 2,000 astronomical units, so you have a drop in the angular momentum towards small scale by a factor of more than 10, which is actually consistent with the uh, uh, models, uh, say, theories of magnetic breaking when you have a rotating and collapsing uh, cloud. I come now to water because, uh, interestingly enough, I mean, water that we at the beginning, we didn't think that uh, this was something that could give us uh, information about the uh, central region of pristellar core. Why? Why? Well, because water should be completely frozen out, and this was at least the prediction of the models. But uh, actually with Herschel, thanks to Herschel, this was work within the WISH team. So this is the water in star forming regions with Herschel that was led, uh, was led by Evin van Dissouk. We were able to get, uh, get this beautiful line that, okay, now is, uh, you don't even see the scale. Uh, sorry. Uh, but anyway, so this is actually quite faint. Uh, we are in the millikelvin uh, uh, regime here, two millikelvin of, uh, uh, say, noise, uh, and uh, the, the line is not uh, so bright. But the important thing is that we have this inverse p signi profile, and that helped us a lot to actually uh, understand how much water we have and also understand the dynamics. What we got from this was like, uh, of course, this uh, gravitational infall, and that has to be within the central 1000 AU because water, you can excite it only at high densities. Uh, so densities like 10 to the 6 or more. 
and you only have those in the center. And you see the emission here. This is the blue part that comes towards you that is in the classical example of infall uh, motions. The total mass of water vapor that we have uh, within the beam of Herschel is 0.5 Earth masses. And then, uh, if you wanted to reproduce this with your chemical model, well, this means uh, that you have to have uh, at least, uh, say, between two and three Jupiter masses of water. So you have uh, a lot of water ice already there, and this water ice is con contracting toward the center, so whatever will form there, so the future stellar system will have, uh, say, already quite a lot of water uh, to, uh, say, play with. And uh, one thing we uh, also pointed out is that we really need this cosmic rays uh, here, because uh, without cosmic rays, there is no way you get this water back into the gas phase. So that was another important point. So now it comes uh, with uh, uh, Eric. Uh, he led uh, this uh, very nice uh, work on the dynamics, uh, because uh, you see, when we look uh, at uh, different uh, predictions uh, from a theory of uh, how core should say, contract and form a star, so they infall and the contraction of uh, dense cores. Well, if you look at the, the density profile of the, what they predict, say, in their uh, density profile, well, you don't see much variation. It's very hard to actually observationally disentangle between uh, these various profiles. This is the singular isothermal sphere, the larsen penston and this is the uh, quasi-equilibrium Bonner-Ebber sphere that uh, is best matching the data that we have from this L1544. However, if you look at the velocity profile, they look very different. So now that we have all this information about the kinematics, uh, and not just the water, but also other lines, so why don't we use these uh, to actually put some constraints? By the way, this quasi-equilibrium, you have to consider uh, this bond ever sphere that is contracting very slowly. And uh, in fact, I mean, if we get uh, to, well, I'll show you here, if you just let it go and contract uh, at a higher velocity, you are completely off in uh, reproducing the water uh, profile, but not just the water, also the CO profile. Okay, so CO, this is the C18O. You can see, for example, the larsen peston you have this two fissures just because in the outer envelope you have large velocities, so you see the back and, the, and uh, front of the cloud, so, and you have the uh, depletion in the center, and in any case, this doesn't work. So this was a very good uh, match, and uh, we could make some constraints, uh, say, on the dynamics. And in fact, uh, this is an overall view of this uh, region. So we have uh, been uh, studying this since many years. Uh, as, uh, as I said, the, the, the lines are bright, uh, so we can uh, study in detail uh, the, the dynamics uh, and also the chemistry. And you can put these in slabs uh, with different extinction grow, going from the outer part to the inner region where the extinction actually goes as high as almost 100 magnitude toward the very center. So it's really dark and the cold, because in fact I didn't point it out, but the temperature that we get from the ammonia VLA data within the 2000 AU is 6 Kelvin. So the other thing here that I have is the density profile of this, uh, uh, say, von Reber sphere that uh, uh, appears to well match the observations, and uh, more, I think even more importantly is the velocity infall profile that show this uh, curve due to the fact that you have the infall increasing toward the center, but then around the 1,000 it drops down because you have this thermally supported central region. Now, this region here is the thing that now I really wanted to study. And uh, we have been getting data with ALMA. We are still analyzing. And uh, I will show you a little bit what we have. And this is what we have. So this is uh, the dust continuum emission seen with ALMA in this uh, core that I have shown you before, the single dish uh, data. So uh, it's, uh, first of all, uh, uh, it, I was very excited to see it because it's very difficult to get the continuum with these starless cores with an interferometer because you have this larger cloud that basically you have most of the flux that is filtered out. But here, actually, we see we are left over only 0.3 solar masses out of these eight solar masses. But you see it, and uh, uh, we see also some hint of substructure toward the center, which uh, is uh, also very, very interesting. This is 1,000 AU bar. And this is the combined uh, ACA and uh, uh, the, ma uh, the main array, of course, uh, for the uh, ALMA. 
Then uh, we come to the lines, so the, this is the curve here, the contours are again at the continuum, and this is DCO plus 3 to 2 that shows this beautiful ring, so again uh, telling us something that we already knew, or that CO is almost gone toward the center because you need CO to form this CO plus, although of course uh, uh, it's a deuterated molecule, so it should peak toward the center, but if you don't have CO, you don't, you're not going to make it. And 2D plus instead uh, is uh, actually, it's quite extended, so it doesn't, it doesn't show this um, sharper peak, say toward the center, but uh, it is uh, tracing here and we see some interesting kinematics that uh, we are still, uh, say, working on and uh, Jaime Pineda is uh, helping with this a lot. There is also some uh, theoretical effort going on in the group, so this is Bo Zhao, who, is, uh, who has been working on pro uh, formation of protoplanetary disk. This is an example of uh, a core that, uh, say, start with similar properties as the L1544. What we have done now here is to use uh, non-ideal MHD with the inclusion of very simple chemistry, so at least we wanted to, uh, say, follow uh, as correctly as possible the ionization fraction that, of course, in a magnetized cloud, it's uh, very important. So here, because of some turbulence uh, that uh, is uh, within uh, the region and uh, the contraction and the magnetic field the twisting, etc., in fact, uh, you predict uh, that you have some substructure, and this is, again, work in progress, so I cannot give you much more, uh, say, information. Information. However, let me move on uh, from these uh, early phases to a little bit later stages, which are the protostellar objects. So once you are in a, uh, the, this protostar switches on, what happens? Well, first of all, uh, you have uh, uh, higher temperature toward the center, so you have basically, you are heating up all the material that was moving toward the center and with temperature, you know, maybe of around 6, 10 Kelvin. And uh, rich in uh, uh, ice, uh, you have all this uh, thick icy mantle around the dust grain. And here, when uh, the temperatures start to get above, uh, say, uh, 30 Kelvin or so, you start to, to release uh, the volatile molecule. And then uh, at 100 Kelvin, you release basically most of the, of the material. So it's actually a good place uh, to look at the ice uh, composition, in a sense, if you catch the star early enough in its, uh, in its life, protostar early enough in its life. So what do we see actually here? So if we have, uh, uh, if we look at, um, for example, the deuterated molecules, what we notice is that, uh, for example, uh, looking at water, I can point out to say ammonia, okay, well, formaldehyde, methanol, uh, we don't need to go into the, all these other details, but uh, the, the main thing that uh, was uh, striking for us is that, well, first of all, you have a lot of deuteration of methanol. People see triply deuterated methanol with very large abundances, and you can see the tri triply, this is the triply deuterated bar, it gets uh, quite large in fraction, and uh, it means that you ne really need to enrich uh, the, the uh, say, the methanol by orders and orders of magnitude compared to the D over H. So here we really talk about more than 10 orders of magnitude. You have to have a super deuteration. This is what uh, Cecilia Ceccarelli, in fact, uh, uh, coined uh, this uh, in, uh, no, not in 98, a bit later, but uh, the super deuteration of, uh, of methanol. And on the other hand, for example, yeah, water can also be deuterated, but uh, we do not see these excesses, say, of uh, deuteration of water. So there is a little bit of uh, difference between the two. And uh, what we think is going on, and now we think at least this part is relatively well understood, is that uh, we believe that uh, and uh, this is actually consistent with the models uh, uh, that take into account the ice formation and the chemistry, and we just look here at the ice formation time, okay? So basically the water formed first, and then we have uh, these other molecules forming later. I have an extra slide to explain more my point. I hope this is more clear. So the, what happened is that when you look, for example, a background star uh, in uh, the London line of sight of molecular cloud, so you look at the background star, you look at the spectrum of the star, you see absorption fissures. And some of these absorption fissures, if you look at the extinctions that are not very large, you see mostly water, okay? Then if you move to our denser region, so basically this means in history of the cloud or the dense core, uh, you start to see also other uh, molecules uh, and uh, what we 
think is going on is that once you go in a region of the cloud where the carbon is mostly in CO form and start to freeze out, so you have lots of CO molecules, to say, on the surface, and they can also start to hydrogenate and deuterate. And of course, toward the center, where you have this large freeze out and the larger the deuteration that goes together, you can actually deuterate a lot the outer layer and make all this deuterated methanol that then come off close to the protostar. There is also deuteration, of course, in disks. And now, I mean, with Karen uh, uh, here, uh, I, she, she showed me some beautiful uh, new example. This is a bit older uh, figure coming from uh, Matthews uh, et al. that shows the deuterated molecule, the DCO plus, the 5 to 4, in uh, the Herbig star HD163296, uh, showing again a larger deuterium fractions. And we know uh, much more. And, uh, more uh, molecules uh, in, uh, in other uh, regions. I think many more uh, disks are coming up. So if I put these things together in a graph, this is what we did in our PP6 uh, work with the Cecilia and also people working in a solar system. If we put together the D over H in water and the D over H in organics in various environments, so going from <laughs> pre-stellar cores, uh, down to Earth, basically, we see that this uh, dichotomy, th this difference uh, between, uh, say, water and the uh, amount of deuteration in water in organics uh, is persistent through many of these objects. Now, the other thing you notice is that there are not many data points here, so that is one work that we have to do, try to fill more. These, but for example, these are the comets. There is only one point here. I am desperately waiting for this Rosetta data for the deuterated molecules, so probably we will have another other point, but we need more points here. So we have uh, organic always higher. And again, if you remember, you can easily do this if uh, you can trap what you're done in, in the pre-stellar phase. You can trap these ices and actually deliver it in the later stages in some way. Okay. Now there is also this nice, uh, very nice work by Ilse uh, Cleves uh, here in 2014 that also uh, give us uh, a message that is similar to what I just said, so that basically to reproduce the D over, o, D over H ratio in our solar system, you really need to bring in some of the ices that are made during the earlier phases. Otherwise, it's very hard to increase this D over H ratio. Okay, so going to the complex organic molecules, I, again, we start from this uh, pre-stellar course because uh, this is where these uh, co uh, complex organics uh, appear to be, uh, at least start to be made, as we will see. Uh, so before doing that, uh, so here in this picture, I just show a bunch of uh, molecules and uh, in particular, this uh, recent paper by, again, Beloche, uh, this uh, uh, very productive group uh, in uh, Bonn uh, that uh, they work on uh, detection of complex organics uh, in uh, star uh, high master forming region. This is the Sagittarius A region. And they recently found that this branched, so kind of bent structure of uh, molecules so that are very interesting, especially because uh, amino acids also have this structure here. So apparently you can make uh, these branched molecules uh, already in this harsh environment uh, in uh, uh, high master forming regions. So uh, with Itascon, Imene Serra in 2014, she did uh, this uh, kind of radiative transfer exercise to see if, uh, for example, pristellar core could be useful also to look for some of these uh, large uh, molecules and with prebiotic uh, interest, like the simplest amino acid, which is uh, uh, glycine. Now, the reason to, to do that, I mean, if we could do that, that'd be great, because, of course, the pristellar core being cold and having very narrow lines, you can identify the lines much better, and you don't have much confusion, because if you look at these uh, massive star-forming regions, you have broad lines, you have everything you can have, and uh, it's very hard to identify. So, for, for example, here there is a, a spectrum or a sp um, simulated spectrum of a massive star forming region, like a hot core type of region, where you have temperatures about 100 or 200 Kelvin. And you see that the glycine, yes, could be much stronger than what you expect in a pristellar core. But lots of uh, uh, lines here where also they will be blended with uh, many more, say, simple uh, molecules that are much more abundant, while for the pristellar core, you expect to have actually uh, 
stronger lines toward the uh, tower lower frequencies in uh, regions that in fact I mean maybe with band, Alma band 2 we could try to uh, to detect so uh, his Askun she started a very deep uh, say observations uh, in these regions so far she did not detect the glycine but she detected many other molecules so here is uh, a result from again uh, this uh, uh, pre-stellar core laboratory which is L1544 and we have here two positions so toward the cloud center so toward the dust peak and uh, here is an offset position is where actually we found the methanol peaking so it's uh, like uh, a region about uh, three, four thousand astronomical units outside. So what she found is that uh, in general, although from this figure here is not so clear, you have to of course to look at the uh, abundances so compare also with the column density of H2 that you get uh, with the Herschel data. But what she found is that the abundance of, of oxygen bearing molecules and some of them are uh, say or, organic, uh, say complex organic molecules are much more abundant toward this methanol peak in this shell of the, of the cloud while others, and in particular the nitrogen bearing molecules, are peaking toward the center. So now, you're, of course, we need to understand why this is uh, the case. So we have uh, some models uh, that uh, have been run by Anton Bazinin that actually shows this uh, peak. So this is the radius and this is the abundance with respect to total hydrogen that the molecules that have been detected, in fact, are predicted to peak toward the center for the simple reason that the tower, uh, sorry, I say tower the center, say tower this uh, shell at about 0.1 uh, parsecs, a few thousand you uh, away, uh, because the tower the center, the density is really too large and you just have, even if you produce these molecules, they can't stay in the gas phase for very long. And uh, so this is a combination of uh, surface chemistry and uh, more importantly I think uh, in the recent years is also say some gas phase chemistry that uh, apparently is very important so you still need of course the dust to form some of the precursor molecules but for example for some of the molecules uh, uh, like uh, in this case, uh, uh, like um, methyl formate and also formamide uh, etc. It seems that also gas phase chemistry is quite important. And this was pointed out uh, several years ago, but uh, I think this paper show it very clearly. This is the Shannon et al. Uh, paper. Uh, it's all people from Leeds. I was very happy when they did this. Uh, so this is, uh, shows the, co the rate coefficient of this system here, OH plus methanol which has a, a barrier, so it's not supposed to go at uh, this low temperature, but actually because it is cold and because in these low temperature environments uh, these two reactants can kind of stay together for, you know, a bit longer than in warmer environment, the uh, barrier can be uh, overcome via tunneling and this is why this rate coefficient is like much larger than what expected at uh, this uh, low temperature that they could measure. I mean, and this is uh, still 60 uh, Kelvin, so it'd be nice to go even lower and see what uh, what happened there. So anyway, there is a lot of new thing coming up uh, for uh, these uh, 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 molecules. And now, of course, we want to also compare what we see in, uh, in space with what we have in the comets, and these uh, many groups are working on this. Uh, here, I am just showing a graph that comes from Beaver et al. This is work done with the 30-meter antenna, but there is also, of course, uh, the paper by Altweg et al. with the 67P uh, comet uh, that was visited by Rosetta, where they also have uh, this beautiful detection of glycine uh, and many other molecules, uh, including also phosphorus uh, uh, PBR molecules that, uh, as you know, it's very important for our, uh, say, DNA and RNA. So anyway, so this is uh, the comparison with the respect to methanol of various molecules that are uh, uh, measured in uh, two uh, comets here and two star forming regions. Let's uh, for the moment uh, forget about the blue and green, but in general, uh, with some notable exception, but in general the abundances are, say, quite close uh, to each other considering how different these uh, regions are, okay? So we talk about, you know, just clouds of uh, material and, and uh, comets, so solid bodies in our uh, um, 
solar system. And then, of course, there is uh, the beautiful work by Karin that also showed here the detection. Well, this was the first detection of complex, uh, say, of organics uh, in uh, disks. And uh, the very nice thing is that if you take the ratio of these organics and uh, you compare with what is found in comets, yes, you have very similar uh, values. So again, uh, it tells us that uh, the solar system chemistry is not so unique, and you can make these uh, uh, probably uh, almost everywhere, okay, in, uh, in, uh, in space. So I have a, a few more minutes, I think. Just checking. It's okay? Okay. So I wanted to then uh, tell you a little bit about this work that I'm doing uh, about these early phases of uh, protoplanetary disk. So this was work that I started when uh, I was in Leeds, and uh, thanks to the collaboration with Aaron Bolli and Richard Durizen, and uh, also, of course, Thomas Hartquist, we were curious about these self-gravitating disks. And, uh, of course, uh, we don't really know yet uh, exactly how these disks are, make, I mean, are made. I mean, we have some ideas. Of course, so you have a rotating cloud, magnetic fields. But that's the problem, actually, because you have magnetic fields, so you have ionized material, and you can have uh, uh, actually coupling of uh, ions with the magnetic field. You, have, you can have some angular momentum loss, and you can actually end up forming zero disk or no disk at all. And this is what has been seen in various uh, simulations in the past. So you have really to tweak and change parameters to make your disk on the first place. I'm not talking even about you know, the evolution of later stages. So we started just to say, okay, fine, let's see if uh, initially these disks are relatively massive compared to the protostar. In that case, one could expect to have these disks self-gravitating, forming some kind of spiral arms and basically shocks along this, uh, these arms that could, of course, uh, stir up the gas, uh, make uh, uh, temperature going up and down, and these we could be able to then, uh, say, measure with the telescope if this is the case or not, and at least answer the question, are disks uh, initially uh, self-gravitating or not, okay? So these are some of the maps that, uh, so this was the original hydrocode uh, after uh, several orbits of the self-gravitating disk from Aaron Bolli. Then we took it, we put the plug in some chemistry, and uh, we have here images of water and H2CO, again showing nicely how different molecules can take different regions of these disks, which is an also nice uh, prediction. This is the work by my student who is still in Leeds, uh, that he actually took uh, one of the um, a smaller disks, so considering a, a disk around a, a proto-solar uh, young solar object, and uh, see if it could also develop, uh, say, these spiral arms, what is the temperature, what is the, uh, basically the dynamics of this uh, disk. And again, if you have the self-gravitating disks in these uh, regions, so even if the total mass of the disk here is only 0.17 solar masses, uh, you can have uh, quite a lot of excursions in temperature and uh, uh, variation. So here I'm showing the um, basically a fluid element, the, the orbit of a fluid element, and it shows here variation in, in seen uh, from above. So you see the disk here. And then if you look uh, at John, you see this uh, uh, spike. So the, there is actually a lot of mixing in the disk. And when you have uh, yellow, it means it's hot. It's about, say, here, 80 Kelvin, if you are in the outer part of the disk. If you are in the inner part of the disk, the temperatures can go up to 500 Kelvin. I mean, it's a very high uh, temperature. Temperature. So again, you have a very zigzagish uh, type of uh, um, uh, orbits uh, here, and uh, so you can imagine that you have lots of mixing. And uh, if you do not uh, form uh, some uh, pebbles or where you can actually hide your eyes and uh, uh, say uh, preserve your eyes from the prestellar phase, uh, definitely, at least in this region here of the disk, you are not going to have much left uh, there. So you have to start from scratch again. And uh, I just uh, noticed, uh, you know, recently there was this nice paper by John Tobin in Nature that actually showed uh, that 
uh, apparently this is the first example of this type of system. So gravitationally unstable disk, but uh, that uh, here has already formation of the protostar inside. And finally, this is my last uh, thing, is the work that is led by Bojao et al. in my group, that we are really looking into this problem of the pro protoplanetary disk formation. And uh, because uh, Bo started to include uh, this chemistry in, uh, in uh, the non-ideal MHD code that he has, we wanted to track and uh, at least uh, uh, say follow as accurately as possible the ionization fraction. Uh, what he discovered is that uh, actually you get uh, something very interesting. So when uh, you start the contraction of your cloud, you have probably the grain size distribution that is uh, uh, the MRN distribution, Matis Rampel-Nortzik uh, distribution. So you have uh, a, uh, say, grain size that uh, um, goes from about uh, 0.005 micrometer up to 2.5 micrometer with a certain power law. Is it 3.5, and then uh, we kind of started to play a little bit with that because one expects that as molecules freeze out, maybe also small dust grains that can also be considered sometimes as the big molecules can also freeze out. And in fact, what happened is that if you get rid of the very small grains, so I mean those that between 10 and 100 uh, angstrom, you have a quite interesting effects in this non-ideal MHD because then here the magnetic diffusivity, the one that basically uh, regulates the ambipolar diffusion, so the slipping of uh, uh, neutral to, uh, say, through magnetic uh, field lines, it has a very large effects because the, these the small grains are tied to the magnetic field lines, so those are the ones who can actually get uh, rid of the angular momentum and uh, produce uh, this magnetic breaking. But otherwise, if you get rid of them, you have uh, not uh, such a problem, and you form, you can uh, form rotationally supported disks of tens of uh, astronomical units in radius. And then you can make all the disk you want, because of course you can change parameters, you can change the cosmic ionization rate initially, you can change the density, the rotation, whatever, you know, and you can make a large, big, uh, with holes, uh, with no holes, but the important thing is that you can make this uh, protoplanetary disk. So I thought that this was uh, worth showing. The other thing I wanted to show uh, is that uh, because of this uh, freezing out, I think we should also take into account the fact that ISIS, of course, will also be enriched by these uh, small grains. And uh, maybe this could be, and this is just, of course, speculation because nobody knows, that this could be the precursor of the organic matter that is found in uh, carbonaceous chondrites, like, for example, the IOM, the insoluble organic matter that uh, resembles some kind of uh, Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon I mean, is much more complicated than that, but uh, it resembled that. And then, of course, the even more interesting soluble organic matter that is made out of amino acids. And all of this material, both this and this, is, yes, highly deuterated. So you still uh, kind of get some of this deuteration from the probably the earlier phases. So, so I just want to go through this uh, quickly, uh, but uh, just to make some of the some points. So. Molecules are unique tracers of dynamics, uh, and they have, of course, helped us uh, since decades to understand uh, the structure of these uh, filaments and uh, uh, how these cores form, although there is still lots of work to do on these. Uh, Pristellar cores, these are uh, dense cores where stars have not formed yet and have uh, large densities. There is this critical value of the central densities that is 10 to the 5, which is exactly the dust gas coupling and uh, apparently after you uh, go beyond this point uh, they, there is a very it, it's very hard to uh, say to uh, not let them contract and this is what we see there is a large amount of co freeze out there is a large amount of diffraction 90 percent of co in solid phase okay if even more actually in the center of this uh, 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 pre-stellar core is uh, 99 there is quasi-static contraction uh, for the few cores that, that uh, have been uh, looked at and uh, formation and uh, probably also high storage, just put in parentheses, because uh, of cons that then can be delivered later. 
uh, there is also this large diffraction in all phases of star formation. As we have seen, we see it from crystallar core down uh, to Earth, basically. And uh, <laughs> this could be easy to explain if crystallar ices are stored. Even a fraction of them are stored and, of course, processed later uh, within uh, pebbles and rocks. There is uh, probably this uh, uh, new way to uh, help the formation of protoplanetary disks, at least in our model, because protoplanetary disks, they know very well how to form depletion of very small grains that can enable uh, the formation of disks. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, this is important for two reasons. One, that uh, you need uh, to follow the microphysics. And this is the beauty of this, uh, uh, say, chemistry and uh, uh, processing uh, processes that you need uh, to follow for dynamics. Uh, and also, it could enrich a lot of the ice uh, chemistry. The COMPs, so the co complex organic molecules abundance uh, are similar. We have seen uh, this is work by Karin, uh, and uh, it fits uh, into this uh, picture here that solar system chemistry is not uh, unique. And remember that we have uh, more than 200 amino acids uh, in the, not just that, also fatty <coughs> acids and nucleobases uh, inside these carbonaceous chondrites, uh, and that uh, all of these have also a large fraction of uh, deuterium. So I would like to conclude here. I want to just show you a little bit uh, the structure of my uh, group in uh, Munich that is made out of uh, observations, theory, and lab, uh, laboratory that just start to uh, now uh, give uh, some of the first results. And then uh, theory, we're uh, working on physical processes, chemistry, and radiative transfer. And then uh, I also wanted to show you some uh, activity going on uh, that is to link together our work of astronomers uh, to uh, much more complicated work done by biophysicists, but with the idea, and this is all people in Munich, there are of course many more people here uh, that uh, work on chemistry, theory, and uh, experimental biophysics uh, that uh, is uh, moving on and hopefully we will try to collaborate finally together and understand the origins of life at least, uh, say, uh, make some progress to say toward that. I don't say to solve the problem. So thank you very much. Great, great, thanks. Uh, questions? You're welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, Alyssa. Hi, Mr. this uh, simplistic view that we have uh, kind of uh, uh, spherically symmetric uh, and uh, yes, we have some contraction motion, but the thing is that uh, what we see there is uh, like uh, quiescent anyway, you know very well, <laughs> the transition to coherence. Uh, but good man, I don't. Uh, anyway, so that's, uh, uh, the, the, these regions are indeed the quiescent, so, but uh, definitely the you know, you have cosmic rays that goes through, that they charge uh, your grains. I was showing this morning, in fact, that they are very important in making, say, distribution of charges much different from what we naively assume in our chemical models. It's not anymore minus one. We have all ranges between plus two, three to minus several. And that can affect, for example, the dust dynamics and can affect also some of the chemistry. We have not... We are just starting now to implement uh, these features in the in the models, and uh, because these are, uh, first of all, you know, we have not much knowledge on the uh, say on the dust itself and also on the ice composition. So we are trying to go in that direction, but it will take some time. So maybe in a few years, hmm? I'll give you an answer. <laughs> you, me <coughs> you mentioned that for the relatively simple organic molecules, mm. the uh, concentration, if you will, 
in meteorites is within an order of magnitude or so of your pre so, uh, pre solar pre stellar Pre-stellar. discs yes. or cores Core. or whatever. Yeah. Uh, what I'd like to know mm. is whether I'm sure you have done calculations for the amino acids that are found in meteorites and how they compare in relative density to the simpler ones in, in meteorites, how that ratio would go in pre-stellar cores and whether you have any hope you within you know an order of magnitude or five orders of magnitude of detecting the in amino the acids. Phase, yes. Right, so there are of course measurements and the numbers uh, associated with the concentration of amino acids and this can change a lot depending on the type of meteorite that you have, so assuming you that chondrites and also the <coughs> primitive one, so I'm sure here there are much more experts than me, so but the C1 or CI, sorry, and some other that the show uh, water, and lots of water, and also lots of organics. So, the concentration is, is small, so it's, uh, it's going to be, say, hard to detect these amino acids uh, in, uh, in space, but we have done this exercise with the glycine, because that at least is the simplest amino acid, so if we can bet on something, we can uh, try... Is it the most common in carbonaceous chondrites? of the amino acids. Right? That I cannot uh, answer right the way. Yeah, I should, uh, yeah, but it's definitely the one that requires a fewer number of atoms. So yes, I, I yeah. appreciate that, but that but doesn't you know, mean it's more that is, complicated. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, no, no, that's, uh, that's true. But uh, so, from our calculations, uh, it seems that uh, the, with very sensitive, with this very sensitive uh, observation, we should be able to detect by stacking, not really detecting the line, but stacking a certain uh, frequency, we should be able to detect the glycine. So we have done this calculation for the glycine. We didn't do it for the more complex, and uh, now, of course, uh, we will do it. <laughs> See, <laughs> maybe we detect a bigger one. But it's really, yeah, it's really hard. You need to basically, yes, have also a bigger broadband uh, uh, Kind of simultaneous observation that is the best thing you can do so you can uh, try to get as many lines as possible and then do a proper stacking analysis work in progress uh, Paolo, one of the really interesting things about l1544 is that its central temperature is so low mm. according to the results that you showed yeah. down to like six six, six kelvin. kelvin yeah and i'm wondering whether that is a, uh, an important feature in the evolution of star forming core, or is it just um, you know, a fluke that happens to apply to this particular core and not necessarily uh, does not necessarily occur in the history, uh, thermal history of other cores? Well, um, I think, I mean, in a sense, this is uh, a little bit we mentioned this in the, in the papers on the two classes, of course. So it's a, I think it's more general than that. Of course, one should prove it. So I don't want to say things that uh, need, of course, observations. We don't have many of these observations yet. You have 1527. Uh, well, OK, but that is not as uh, dense as 1544. In any case, I think what happened is that when you go, so assuming that you have like a normal interstellar radiation field, uh, if you go dense enough that the gas-dust coupling takes over, you start this kind of runaway cooling of the dust. And uh, so it could well be that uh, if density is above 10 to the 5, I, I actually could expect to see this drop in temperature. And this drop in temperature that makes uh, the cloud uh, you know, from isothermal, isothermal to actually having this gradient in temperature could affect, in a sense, the dynamics because yes, it can make it more unstable and uh, you know can trigger. So I think it's just that this uh, dust gas coupling density that uh, is very important that uh, on uh, for the for the evolution, yes, of the core in general. I don't know if you want to say some more. Uh, 
No, that's good. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Why aren't awesome. there more examples? More examples. So there is uh, N183 uh, that has been studied, uh, and also the, so there is this central temperature of 7 Kelvin that was found, uh, not with uh, interferometers. So maybe if you go to an interferometer, it can go even uh, lower. The problem is that the ammonia, uh, although, okay, you can go up to a point within the core, but ammonia is not the great tracer of the super dense regions, you know, as you well know, because uh, the critical density is not very large. So we need uh, to, I think, get uh, some uh, other thermometer to go uh, deeper and find. Uh, maybe also with the ALMA, you see with the dust, uh, if we can measure several wavelengths, so we can actually, that was one of our points uh, that we're trying to do, look at the temperature of the dust uh, in the center. But uh, yeah, if you see some core that is larger than 10 to the 5 per cubic centimeter, then you start to see large deterioration that is also goes with the low temperature and lots of freeze out. So something happens when you reach that density. Yeah. Ammonia is nice because it's more volatile and doesn't freeze out. Formaldehyde freezes out. Which is, a, that's another mystery because, uh, you know, the binding energy of ammonia is as large as that of water. So there is, of course, there must be some production in the gas phase that, uh, yeah. Um, I have a question. So you sure. showed one slide about the measurement of water vapor column density. Yes. You backed out the total amount of water ice. So is that backing out model dependent? Like, uh, do you do you have an assumption that the vapor is in some sort of equilibrium with ice? So for this, we have uh, say the, the models have uh, considered like the evolution of the chemistry in a cloud where you have gas and dust. So you have uh, you know collision of gas with the dust, uh, freeze out, and the important point is the desorption. Because if you just let it go and uh, not to desorb the species, you basically end up with thick icy mantles and no molecules except for H2, H2 plus helium plus and some other things. So it's like early universe chemistry. But it's not really what we see. I mean, we see still uh, quite a lot of molecules, including water. So the, there is this uh, non-thermal desorption mechanism that is very important for the water, which is due to the cosmic rays, we believe, we think. Uh, so because we can reproduce this with uh, uh, the fact that cosmic rays both can, say, heat a bit the dust. Actually, this is not important for water because they're not able to heat it up at temperature that are high enough for the water to desorb. But what they can do is that they can excite H2 molecules, and the H2 molecules uh, cascade down fluorescent produce UV photons, and these UV photons photodesorb the water. This is what we think is going on. So it's a balance between you know, the freeze out and uh, you need this cosmic rays. So this is actually telling us that there are cosmic rays also in these dense regions. Uh, we could try to put limits on that as well. Do you have a question maybe? Uh, yes, I did. Um, <laughs> from the get-go, your talk has been, as you said, about seeing a complex molecular chemistry now being discovered as the precursors of life. But is there any compelling observation that demonstrates that they're not postcursors of life of long ago in the universe? Oh, that's fantastic. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> ah, OK. So you're saying something that was already there. Long ago. And maybe, you know, it's just part of the dust, who knows? Yes. And then uh, for some reason you have sputtering or vaporization of that. No, I have not thought about that, but you know, it's, I don't know how to start with though, <laughs> if I want to do I that. I suggest you start with the following. It's okay. It's been found that the 2300 angstrom bump in the interstellar curve, which uh -huh. is extremely universal, yes. is probably the result of something like buckyballs. And we talk it's about mm -hmm. the interstellar dust being made of para, uh, what is it, uh, paracyclic, no, ma, uh, yeah. polycyclic aromatic. PAHs, okay. polycyclic yeah. aromatic hydrocarbons. And from my work with Adolf Witt, we found they're devilishly difficult to make in a laboratory, but plants <laughs> make them easily and commonly. Yes. Right, That's well, a good place to start. Good, good <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> All right, let's thank Paula. <laughs>
thin isotopolog and you can even measure the optical depth because it has hyperfine components. So the best way or say the simplest way to understand this is that uh, you have CO molecules freezing out onto the surface of dust grains. How much of this? Well, actually, if you use uh, CO as a tracer of mass, well, you are actually in error here because uh, you, you lose about 2.3 solar masses uh, out of the total solar mass of the whole uh, core here, which is about eight solar masses. So this, for the central region, definitely CO is not good. Of course, I should uh, quote uh, here uh, earlier work done by Willacy and uh, uh, also worked by Ted Bergin uh, in, on B68. <clears throat> so in these cases, these are less centrally concentrated uh, objects, so that it's uh, not as extreme as this. Now, the, once you have a CO freeze out, you then need to find the molecule that is good in tracing the central region. So that was our job more than 10 years ago. And uh, we actually found that uh, the deuterated molecules are very good tracers of regions uh, that uh, where CO is frozen out. We kind of knew that because there was a theory that I will show you that told us actually in the 80s that that was the case. So this is again the uh, submillimeter continuum emission. This is the N2H plus in color. This is the N2D plus in color. You start to see the shift in the peaks. Uh, N2H plus is not actually peaking toward the dust peak. There is already, you start to see some freeze out of the N2H plus here, but N2D plus is peaking. And the, the, uh, fra uh, the fraction of this deterioration is 20%. And you have to compare with this with the 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5, which is the D over H cosmic abundance. There have been uh, many, uh, you know, here I'm not even quoting all, but uh, many papers uh, measuring the ethereum fractions, and you can see that uh, some numbers go really high, uh, close to unity. I just put these in uh, yellow, not just because Silvia Spezzano is in my group now, and she's doing a great job, but also because there are some people from the audience here, like Mike McCartney, who actually uh, helped us with these uh, studies. So, so this was the discovery of the doubly deuterated uh, uh, C3D2 and the measurement of the deuteration. It's not just this little core that has this high deuteration and see off result. We see this everywhere we look at. Of course, you have to choose a region that is relatively quiescent. You don't want to go nearby a massive star because then, of course, you have feedback, you have heating, and you're not going to find the initial conditions. You have triggered the conditions, but that is not what we are interested. Uh, so here, for example, an infrared dark cloud, these are these very dense clouds that are seen uh, say, in, uh, uh, so they are opaque in, in the infrared, that's why they're called the infrared dark clouds. And uh, what you see here is the map of the N2D+. Plus. So we have the N2D+, plus, uh, actually, uh, the all uh, around this map is quite extended. And also the CO is uh, uh, depleted. Here we get up to depletion factors of five, which means that, uh, uh, say, about 85% of the CO is in the, on the surface of the grains. The uh, thing here that I wanted to show is just that uh, you know, there are many now studies that have been done. So it seems that it's a quite uh, universal, at least to say in our uh, galaxy, universal factor that you have this, uh, CO, this uh, freeze out of molecules and then uh, this activation of the deuteration. How does it go? Uh, well, this is, I think, the main reaction. You see this goes uh, back to the 70s by Watson, who studied this process. And uh, uh, pointed out that this reaction is exothermic, so in cold gas this reaction cannot proceed from uh, right to left. And uh, then there was Dalgarno and uh, Lepp, who in 84, with a very short paper, they uh, explain uh, very well that actually if neutrals for any reason, they didn't even mention, say, freeze out, if for any reason uh, this uh, um, say, neutrals like CO and N2 and oxygen that destroy these ions are gone, you have an increase in this uh, ratio. And the reason is that you have lower destruction rates on one side for the, both of these ions and also higher formation rate just because these proceed faster because you have more H3+. plus. So at the end, you have the larger D over H and uh, these, of course, uh, can move on, uh, not just to H2D+, plus, but also D2H+, plus, et cetera. And in fact, uh, this is what we saw, I mean, a very bright H2D+, plus orto line. This was back in 2003. 
and this was in one of these pre-stellar cores. So it was very uh, well matched with the theory, although at that time uh, the theory, uh, say the chemical theory, was not very good because we couldn't predict uh, uh, these uh, when we did uh, these uh, observations, I mean, in our proposal. But anyway, this was great because uh, we could actually trigger uh, great people to do new laboratory work, to do theory on this uh, uh, ion, and uh, this is the work that uh, we are still uh, uh, doing at the moment. There is a little trick about the deuterium fraction, but actually the trick is uh, kind of uh, good for us because we can learn how to use this uh, uh, for measuring ages of clouds that has been uh, a kind of... So today's speaker is um, Professor, um, no, Director Paola Caselli now. Um, so Paola is a, one of the directors of the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Munich. And she's also visiting professor at Leeds and the University of Florida at Gainesville, Ludwig Maximilian's University in Munich. <laughs> sure thing. And... Um, she studied physics and astronomy at the University of Bologna, and uh, in her PhD she worked at Ohio State University with Eric Herbst, and also here with Phil Myers. And she's been a researcher at the Osservatorio Astrophysica de Arquetri, with, uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, with Galileo, along with Galileo, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, she was um, visiting uh, scientists at UC Berkeley, yeah, right, and lecturer in uh, the Department of Astronomy here at Harvard University, where she did her best work with me. <laughs> um, that's about wraps it up. So that's a bit biased, and, uh, but yeah. She's going to uh, <laughs> talk about astrochemistry at the dawn of star and planet formation. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, Eddie. Uh, <clears throat> so. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm actually just so excited to see all of you guys. I mean, it feels really like coming back home and, uh, you know, giving this talk to my family. So I'm, I'm even more kind of nervous as uh, I should be. So I apologize if sometimes I just say something and just ask questions if something doesn't make sense. So anyway, so I will, uh, yeah, today I will just go through uh, some of the uh, important steps uh, toward the formation, uh, say, of uh, stars and planets, uh, following this uh, through the astrochemistry tale. And uh, uh, we will see that uh, actually uh, it is very important, uh, one stage in this uh, star for star and planet formation process, <laughs> that uh, is uh, uh, this uh, starless course. As we will see, there are many of the processes that we then give, uh, uh, say, um, results uh, and, uh, for example, produce molecules that we will also see them later on in these other phases. So, so these are the various steps. So we start, uh, of course, we start with clouds, interstellar medium uh, material that then uh, contracts uh, and forms some dense regions, uh, and uh, these dense region fragments form dense cores, uh, and you have uh, then uh, the formation in some of these dense cores, the formation of protostars that then uh, evacuate uh, the uh, the cloud, and then you see these beautiful disks. And uh, here, of course, you can follow these various stages, and even nowadays in our solar system, where we see and we can measure uh, primitive material that is uh, within uh, rocks, uh, like uh, carbonaceous chondrites. So the question is, uh, is there actually any link between uh, this uh, phase and the, the later uh, stages? So I will try to show you that actually, yes, we think there are some links. And so let's move on, and uh, I want to give you a little bit more motivation 
So we know now about 200 molecules and without considering isotopologues. So these are uh, the, the majority of the molecules that are known and seen in space are organic in nature. So the greenish molecules here are organic in nature. And uh, some of them are actually important uh, building blocks that then uh, are, uh, uh, can form even more uh, complex organics like prebiotic molecules, like for example, the amino acetonitrile that was discovered in 2008 by our Nobel Lotion collaborators. This is just a step away from glycine, the simplest uh, amino acid. And of course, if we look at the primitive material in our solar system, we see in uh, some of these uh, uh, meteorites, so in particular some of the most primitive carbonaceous chondrites, a lot of uh, uh, basically the building blocks of life. So we have not even uh, just the 20 amino acids that we use in life, but we have hundreds of them. You can choose uh, any, anything you want, and then uh, you have not just that, you have the fatty acids, you have nucleobases, basically everything you need to build a, a living being. Then, of course, the question is how you do that. That is a big question that uh, is uh, many people are still working on. Good, okay, so the outline, so I will just go through um, some, say, historical uh, views to do an introduction about molecular clouds and then scores. Then I will uh, move into these uh, important uh, processes that are like the freeze out and the discontinuum emission at uh, 1.3 millimeter. So you see that the deuterated molecule just peak there and you can also learn, of course, with the kinematics, so you can learn about uh, velocity gradients, so you can learn about uh, specific angular momentum, and this is one thing that uh, we found, uh, that uh, going from scales of uh, a fraction of a parsec, say 0.1 parsec of the core, uh, that is traced by the ammonia down to, say, 2,000 astronomical units, so you have a drop in the angular momentum towards small scale by a factor of more than 10, which is actually consistent with the uh, uh, models, uh, say, theories of magnetic breaking when you have a rotating and collapsing uh, cloud. I come now to water because, uh, interestingly enough, I mean, water that we at the beginning, we didn't think that uh, this was something that could give us uh, information about the uh, central region of pristellar core. Why? Why? Well, because water should be completely frozen out, and this was at least the prediction of the models. But uh, actually with Herschel, thanks to Herschel, this was work within the WISH team. So this is the water in star forming regions with Herschel that was led, uh, was led by Evin van Dissouk. We were able to get, uh, get this beautiful line that, okay, now is, uh, you don't even see the scale. Uh, sorry, it's, uh, but anyway, so this is actually quite faint. Uh, we are in the millikelvin uh, uh, regime here, two millikelvin of, uh, uh, say, noise, uh, and uh, the, the line is not uh, so bright. But the important thing is that we have this inverse P-Signi profile, and that helped us a lot to actually uh, understand how much water we have and also understand the dynamics. What we got from this was like, uh, of course, this uh, gravitational infall, and that has to be within the center of 1000 AU because water, you can excite it only at high densities. Uh, so densities like 10 to the 6 or more, and you only have those in the center. And you see the emission here. This is the blue part that comes towards you that is in the classical example of infall uh, motions. The total mass of water vapor that we have uh, within the beam of Herschel is 0.5 Earth masses. And then, uh, if you wanted to reproduce this with your chemical model, well, this means uh, that you have to have uh, at least, uh, say, between two and three Jupiter masses of water. So you have uh, a lot of water ice already there, and this water ice is contracting toward the center, so whatever will form there, so the future stellar system, will have, uh, say, already quite a lot of water uh, to, uh, say, play with. And uh, one thing we uh, also pointed out is that we really need this cosmic rays here because uh, without cosmic rays, there is no way you get this water back into the gas phase. So that was another important point. So now it comes uh, with uh, uh, Eric. Uh, he led uh, this uh, very nice uh, work on the dynamics because, uh, you see, when we look at uh, different uh, predictions from a theory of how core should say, contract and form a star, so the infall and the contraction of uh, dense cores. Well, if you look at the, the density profile of the, what they predict, say, in their uh, density profile, well, you don't see much variation. It's very hard 
to actually observationally disentangle between uh, these various profiles. This is the singular isothermal sphere, the larsen Penston, and this is the uh, quasi-equilibrium Bonner-Eber sphere that uh, is best matching the data that we have from this L1544. However, if you look at the velocity profile, they look very different. So now that we have all this information about the kinematics, uh, and not just the water, but also other lines, so why don't we use these uh, to actually put some constraints? By the way, this quasi-equilibrium, you have to consider uh, this Bonder-Eber sphere that is contracting very slowly. And uh, in fact, I mean, if we get uh, to, well, I'll show you here, if you just let it go and contract uh, at a higher velocity, you are completely off in uh, reproducing the water uh, profile, but not just the water, also the CO profile, okay? So CO, this is the c 18 o you can see, for example, the larsen Peston, you have this two fissures so just because in the outer envelope you have larger velocities, so you see the back and, the, and uh, front of the cloud, so, and you have the uh, depletion in the center, and in any case, this doesn't work. So this was a very good uh, match, and uh, we could make some constraints, say, on the dynamics. And in fact, this is an overall view of this region. So we have been studying this since many years. As, uh, as I said, the, the, the lines are bright, so we can study in detail the, the dynamics and also the chemistry. And you can put this in slabs with different extinction grow, going from the outer part to the inner region where the extinction actually goes as high as almost 100 magnitude toward the very center. So it's really dark and the cold, because in fact I didn't point it out, but the temperature that we get from the ammonia VLA data within the 2000 AU is 6 Kelvin. So the other thing here that I have is the density profile of this, uh, uh, say, von Reber sphere that uh, uh, appears to well match the observations, and uh, more, I think even more importantly is the velocity in full profile that show this uh, curve due to the fact that you have the in full increasing toward the center, but then around the 1,000 it drops down because you have this thermally supported central region. Deuterium fraction, that by the way it's important also because uh, also in our Earth, as you know, our ocean are deuterated in a sense, the water there is a rate between heavy water and water that is 10 times larger than the uh, D over H cosmic abundance. Talk about uh, uh, the water and the pristellar core dynamics, uh, and then uh, some uh, complex, organic mole uh, complex organic molecules uh, in uh, various uh, uh, phases. And then if I have the time, I'll show you some of the recent work that we have been doing on the early phases of the uh, protoplanetary disk. So let's get moving. Uh, our galaxy, so I think I don't need to explain much here, except for the fact that where you see these uh, dark lanes that are those where cold material, in particular gas and dust, uh, with temperatures, say, below 100 Kelvin, uh, they basically don't shine at all if you look at them in the optical. But, as we know, since many years now, they shine in molecules. And you see these molecules, these organic molecules, basically everywhere. Of course, the oil is the most abundant of them, and uh, then, in fact, the CO is not, uh, say, the best uh, tracer of uh, the dense regions where uh, the stars are forming, like uh, you need to go to rarer isotopologues, and now you start to see some correlation between the young stellar objects that are in colors and uh, the dark uh, regions here that are the uh, filaments seen in 13CO. If you want to just focus on the filaments, then you have to go even uh, deeper in, and then you need to use uh, even uh, rarer isotopologues like c 18 o and now you start to kind of identify sometimes uh, the so-called dense cores. This is uh, uh, work uh, uh, led by Phil Myers uh, and collaborator, this uh, uh, very important paper in 1989, where it showed um, very important properties of these regions where actually stars, so these are the basic units of star formation. But you don't see them very well in CO. You see them in molecules like ammonia, you see them in molecules that actually requires a bit higher density than what is required for the CO line to be excited. And in, for example, this is work that I did when uh, I was here and then uh, published a bit later. Uh, it was on the N2H plus that uh, this is a great tracer of dense gas. And by dense, I mean anything that is uh, between a few times 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6 uh, per cubic centimeter. <clears throat> 
H2 molecules per cubic centimeter. So, uh, with Eric, uh, we then uh, look into these a little bit uh, deeper and uh, realize that actually there, there seems to be some kind of two classes of these dense cores. So, we are talking about now dense cores that have not yet started yet. We, we are interested, I'm interested in understanding how stars form. So, I want to know the initial conditions. So, on the sky in our galaxy, these nearby cores that you can measure very much in detail, you can look at their density profiles. You can look at the abundance of CO, which is here. So this is in uh, log CO, is the red. This is the transmission, so it's e to the minus uh, visual extinction, and the log density, so this is uh, in uh, the blue. So you start to see striking differences between uh, uh, different cores, in this particular case it's B68 and L1544. What is the main difference here? The main difference is that uh, cores like 1544 are highly centrally concentrated, that they have very spiky type of uh, density profile, and you also have a, a very sharp <clears throat> CO frees out. So CO disappears, and I will show you in a minute. Uh, so these things, what happened here is that uh, we have also line profile molecules that, of course, are unique tracers of dynamics that can tell us that in uh, this case uh, here, for example, this is work uh, that was uh, led by Charlie Lada uh, here, showing that uh, these line profiles are consistent with oscillation. In, uh, uh, in this case uh, here, we have actually profiles consistent with the contraction motions. <clears throat> and uh, we call this, uh, or say I call this, so from now on, I call these pre-stellar cores. Why? Because uh, these are the cores that are going to form stars because uh, they are, uh, say, out of equilibrium. They are contracting. We see that there is inward motion, so it's very hard to, uh, say, believe that they will not form uh, a star. So let me just uh, uh, give you now a switch into the uh, chemistry a little bit more. So this is the millimeter dust continuum emission uh, from uh, this uh, pristellar core that we have been studying very much because uh, it's very nearby, it's bright. And uh, as you can imagine, this pristellar core don't have a very long life because uh, they are short-lived. These are going to form stars <laughs> relatively soon. So then uh, what uh, it means is that uh, you're not going to find them many around, okay? So it means that if you find one, look at that and, uh, you know, just try to understand what's going on as much as you can and then try to find some others. Anyway, so this is the dust peak that you see. So, in, uh, uh, again, a long time ago, we did uh, this measurement of the C17O, showing that uh, there is uh, a nice hole in the CO in correspondence of the dust peak. And remember that this is uh, an optically uh, difficult problem, and it probably still is, because there are, of course, uh, observational difficulties, etc. but I think we are getting close to this. So, what it is, I'll try to explain uh, briefly here. So, we have uh, the... Uh, H2 molecule that uh, has uh, two forms, has the para and the ortho. This is the, depends on the orientation of the spins. Uh, and uh, the para has a ground state at zero level, and then uh, the ortho has uh, the ground state at much higher energy. Now, depending on uh, what is the collisional partner for this reaction uh, here, so for the, to go back, uh, say, to the H3 uh, plus and uh, HD, if you have ortho H2 that is more energetic, uh, it will overcome more easily this activation energy uh, and uh, it will uh, basically drive the reaction backward and reduce uh, the deuterium <laughs> fraction. So it's very important to understand what is the ortho to par H2. It's not just uh, that you want to know the temperature, the density, to, to understand uh, the chemistry. You also need this ratio, and this ratio is terribly hard to measure because uh, you see here these energies, so there is no way that we're going to see these lines in, uh, in cold gas. The other curve here is the deuterium fraction. So you see that uh, as you move down in this curve, there is a mirror curve that is the deuterium fraction that goes up and uh, reaches the values that are typically observed. So you really, so it, we have to have this uh, plateau here. We have to arrive at this plateau here to uh, say reproduce what is seen in some of these uh, uh, objects. So uh, we talk about, you see, million years, and uh, that uh, is. Uh, um, 
for this dense gas, sometimes this means that uh, you are looking at uh, objects that are probably standing there since about a million years, which is about sometimes 10 times a day. Uh, freefall time or dynamical time because we are talking about the densities of the order 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 uh, and even more. Uh, so anyway, uh, I hear very quickly just to say uh, two things. Uh, so one is that the chemistry of these ions is actually very simple uh, and it has been tested and uh, we at the end you can reduce the system to very few expressions. And the other thing that I want to say here is that, okay, you cannot measure ortho to power H2, but you can measure the ortho to power H2 d plus, and these two things are, uh, say, uh, very, say, can be connected with the coefficients that are just the rate coefficients of this reaction, with plus and minus just meaning uh, forward, uh, forward and backward. Uh, and then uh, you can actually, if you measure these, you can understand these, and you can have a uh, understanding of this time scale. One thing that I didn't say here is that why do we start with three here? Well, the starting of three here is the starting point when molecules are formed on dust grains, and uh, we think that the H2 uh, will just uh, take off the uh, statistical ratio, which is three to one, okay? Okay, so then uh, we did that. We have uh, the ortho H2D plus that can be observed uh, with APEX, for example. Uh, back 10 years ago was the CSO that uh, we used. And now, uh, unfortunately, Herschel was not able to detect the line, the 1.37 terahertz line of uh, para H2D plus, but with Sophia, we were able to do it along the line of sight of a very young protostar. So a region where you have still a lot of cold M Envelope, so you are probing the cold material along the line of sight. And in this case, we got, so comparing these two, and of course with our chemical uh, models and staying as conservative as possible, we found, uh, say, age estimates of about uh, 10 times the uh, free fall time. So a region that uh, must, uh, in a sense, have some support of extra support, uh, otherwise it was supposed to collapse, say, toward the center and for the star. These are the lines I have been talking about, just in case you are interested uh, in trying to detect them. So I just say that the par H2D plus and the ortho D2H plus can only be observed with uh, Sophia. So the, ortho, the para D2H plus, I should say also quote the work done by Berenger Paris in 2011, where she detected it uh, in uh, a core in Ophiuchus. And now we have also, for, this is the first detection of ortho D2H plus with Sophia that was done uh, not long ago and the Yorma Harhu is re leading this uh, work. You see this beautiful absorption line again and uh, you also have an uh, interesting shape of the line so you can actually learn about the kinematics of this envelope and uh, so there is all the modeling going on but I don't want to bother you with this now. So deuterated molecules are great uh, species to uh, say, measure the motions and the properties of the center region of these uh, cores. <coughs> Here, for example, uh, I have a, uh, the work done by Antonio Crapsi in 2007, where we have uh, some interferometric data. The color is interferometric uh, uh, ammonia, and here is interferometric deuterated ammonia. This dashed circle here is the same as this one. This is just a zoom in, and this is the 90% contour of the...